explanation of uh, how India uh, interacted with For those of you who were there, uh, we saw <coughs> India's interaction with the civilizations in the West. So that was Mesopotamia. World, um, because the all interconnected, especially through the Silk Roads, which we will see shortly. Uh, but it's convenient uh, for our purpose. And uh, <clears throat> this will kind of conclude the preliminary phase of, you know, foundations of Indian civilization. Next week, we'll have actually three lectures, if I am right, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, where we're going to start seeing very specific aspects of uh, uh, Indian culture and heritage, like uh, there will be one on sacred geometry and uh, uh, and uh, architecture. There will be one on the chronology of Ayodhya, and uh, there will be one on uh, uh, education in ancient India. So that will conclude our first phase, and will resume in October. So now let me start with. Uh, in fact, uh, many of you should have identified. Uh, uh, the, the slide as you, I used as uh, the frontispiece, this was one of the two famous Bamiyan Buddhas which were, as you know, uh, blasted by the Taliban's uh, some years ago uh, when they were powerful in Afghanistan. And um, <clears throat> the, these are, one I think is about 52 meters in height and another is 57 meters, something of that kind. So very colossal statues which are gone forever. And, um, uh, but the thing is that what people usually do not really realize is that Bamiyan uh, was not just uh, two statues, it was a whole complex. You can see here the, the caves which were actually very well organized as complexes of cells for the monks who lived there. What did the monks do? They did not just meditate the whole day. Uh, they basically, Bamiyan was at a crossroads leading into uh, uh, Central Asia and um, uh, they were actually translating texts, copying texts, copying manuscripts and this was basically a, a place where and you have in fact uh, some of the some of them even quite higher up in the hills I think I can't see very well but there, there are cells even higher up. This was one of the major centers of diffusion of Buddhism uh, through Central Asia and uh, from there from there into China and into the, the Silk Route uh, westward as we saw the other day. So <clears throat> let me uh, first of all stop for a minute and discuss those mechanisms of interaction which are valid for all the regions we are going to see today. How exactly did India interact with those other uh, regions, other civilizations, other cultures. The main mechanism, of course, was trade because it's very well known that, um, uh, well, uh, India was a major trading partner with uh, all of these regions. <coughs> For example, in Southeast Asia, which we're going to see a little later today, uh, there is evidence, firm evidence of trade from the first century uh, CE, and this is confirmed, in fact, by Buddhist literature, even a little earlier than that. We have a Buddhist text, for example, uh, talking about a, a trader by name Nagadutta who travels to Swarnabhumi. Now, Swarnabhumi, golden land, is a term which initially was a little fluid. It was uh, uh, something across the, you know, the Bay of Bengal. Uh, many lands were called Swarnabhumi. Ultimately, that term got fixed to Indonesia in particular. And, um, and, and therefore, he goes with uh, uh, 500 ships, which might be a little bit of an exaggeration in all likelihood. A few centuries BC, it looks a little unlikely. But then he conducts uh, uh, trade and riches himself, etc. And there are uh, other texts uh, confirming these kind of stories. So, so the, 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 the trade with the eastern region is well known, uh, even a couple of centuries BC in the literature. And in fact, here you have a coin of, uh, this is, the coin is a little later, 1st or 2nd century CE, that means AD. 
which uh, is from the Shatavahana uh, dynasty, which shows a seafaring ship. You can notice the two masts and, uh, and uh, you see how this is a slightly more sophisticated ship than the Harappan boats we saw earlier. And this ship is crossing the seas. Uh, in fact, this is another one <coughs> from Ajanta. Uh, several ships are, are, are drawn, uh, are depicted in the Ajanta paintings. And this one you see has three masts. Uh, in fact, it out to me that there was another one controlling this uh, uh, sail here. So uh, this would be for controlling the direction of the ship. And uh, so the, the shipping technology was already quite uh, advanced around 2,000 years ago. And um, uh, in fact, there are Sanskrit texts on the fabrication, the manufacture of ships. But the texts probably date a little later. And so there's a whole uh, uh, technology associated with this. The second mechanism, of course, riding over piggyback on the trade networks was traveling monks. And this we're going to see in greater detail. Uh, these monks were traveling sometimes on, out of their own will, uh, but sometimes on invitation, specific invitation, and this will be the case particularly with China, uh, f you know, from, from those countries. So. Um, the third is military campaigns, but this is extremely rare. In fact, uh, one of the rare examples we have of a, a military campaign conducted outside India by an Indian king is the example of the Cholas of uh, South India, uh, which conducted uh, especially um, uh, the, 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 uh, the early, the Chola in the 11th century. Uh, they conducted military campaigns in Indonesia. Uh, this was basically for political purpose, to, to, you know, for their greater glory and to establish uh, some power centers there, which anyway did not last long. But it was totally disconnected with the cultural diffusion which we are going to see. It was an independent phenomenon. Now we start with China, <coughs> and I thought that the best tribute we can give on India's contribution to China is actually by somebody who was quite hostile to it. In the sense, he is in 1940, Hu Xi is a Chinese ambassador to the, um, to the US, and you know 1940 is of course the regime of Mao Zedong, uh, which uh, officially uh, you know, puts down religion, officially looks down upon religion, and uh, therefore he is not somebody particularly favorable to, to, to Buddhism. Yet he writes that India conquered and dominated China culturally for 2,000 years without ever having to send a single soldier across her border. This is most important. This is something that the Chinese had a little, have a little difficulty to understand nowadays, perhaps. How could India dominate you know, without any kind of military expansion into China? China was overwhelmed, baffled, and overjoyed. She begged and borrowed freely from this munificent giver. The first borrowings were chiefly from the religious life of India, and he means principally Buddhism here, in which China's indebtedness to India can never be fully told. So coming from necessarily a critique of religion, it's a, it's a high, uh, very valuable testimony. And this is exactly how it happened. It did happen like that. Uh, the contact with China is uh, anciently documented in India. Mahabharata refers to Chinnas. Uh, who may be uh, populations coming from China or northeast, and it's not very, very clear in the, in the Mahabharata context, but uh, Kautilya, 4th century uh, BC probably, specifically refers to the import of Chinese silk. So we know that the networks are already established <coughs> in that time. Uh, on the other side, in the, on the side of the Chinese literature, BC, Though some authors claim that there are more ancient references, I was not able to really find uh, very genuine references. But 2nd century BC, very firm um, uh, references to North India and to travels there. Then we have a series of Chinese travelers to India who thankfully, very luckily for us, have left extensive chronicles, travelogues as we would call them today, detailed narratives 
of the cities they have uh, visited, the distances between those cities, uh, the, the customs of the pop local populations. Uh, of course, their main interest is Buddhism. You see what happened uh, briefly is that China, a few centuries BC, heard about the spread of Buddhism in North India. And uh, people there were very interested. It is not as if they had nothing. They had Confucianism, which is more of an ethical, philosophical system. Uh, they had Taoism, which is more of a semi-esoteric, semi-mystical, uh, but also philosophical system. So they had already great teachers in China. It's not that there was a complete vacuum. Nevertheless, for some reason, they wanted to learn about this Buddhism. So two things happened. One, they sent some of their people, like these, to find out and uh, document and learn the local languages, and especially uh, Pali, which was the language uh, of uh, Buddhist literature. And they invited Indian monks, scholars of Buddhism, into China to come and teach Buddhism. So it was a kind of a demand from China. It is not that India decided that uh, we'll go and uh, you know, convert China to Buddhism. This idea absolutely did not exist. Uh, the second one, so, so excuse me, Fayan was uh, one of the first major, they were travelers earlier, but they have not left many uh, uh, testimonies. Uh, he left a record of Buddhistic uh, kingdom uh, after spending 15 years in India and Sri Lanka, 4th to 5th century CE. Then Itzing, uh, you will forgive my pronunciation of Chinese, I just uh, cannot uh, guarantee. 7th century, leaving uh, Buddhist monastic traditions of Southern Asia. And Itzing translated over 60 major Buddhist texts into Chinese. So little by little they built their own literature. Finally, uh, one of the best known, perhaps the best known, is Huan Song or Suan Song. And uh, within brackets, you have the modern Chinese uh, uh, spelling. Also, of the 7th century, who spent uh, uh, several years in India out of a 17 year journey. And he left the great Tang, Tang was the, low, the, the dynasty, dominant dynasty in China in those days, records of the Western regions. Because let's not forget that. For the for the we so uh, and then the, many things happened. For example, there were exchanges at the level of mathematics. Uh, they borrowed a little bit of uh, uh, Indian mathematics. For example, the the uh, table of signs of Aryabhata. But many more things, which uh, I'm going briefly to show. Uh, for example, there is a strong tradition in China and somewhat in. Uh, Japan, in fact, this painting is from a Japanese painter in the 19th century, that martial arts were taught first in China by an Indian uh, teacher. And his name is said to be Bodhidharma, who traveled all the way from South India to North China, settled at the Shaolin, uh, Shaolin sorry, monastery, and meditated there for nine years before he was ultimately accepted and uh, then taught uh, techniques of Indian martial arts. Um, this is a tradition. We cannot you know, prove it in an absolute manner, but it is interesting that it comes mostly from the Chinese side. India has uh, some traditions in Kerala uh, to that effect. And Kerala, as you might know, uh, is today uh, one of the main repositories for traditional Indian martial arts, especially Kalari Payatu. So whether there is a connection or not is too much to say, but uh, uh, this is what the Chinese maintain. This is a map of uh, Fayan itinerary. Uh, you can see the kind of huge distances, huge distances that these pilgrims courageously covered in, uh, you see, crossing uh, the, the uh, Taklamakan Desert, which encloses the whole Tarim Basin, and uh, then, uh, uh, you know, crossing all these mountains, uh, finally landing uh, uh, at uh, Taxila, and uh, uh, then, of course, entering the Indo-Gangetic Plains, uh, which are much easier to travel. But he additionally returned to China through the sea route, you see. So it's, uh, it's an enormous uh, uh, journey, and they must have been tremendously motivated. Uh, this is one uh, text, uh, is a Buddhist uh, uh, text illustrating 
using uh, in translation activities translating Indian texts into Chinese. <laughs> this is uh, Huan Sang, an old painting of uh, Huan Sang traveling in India uh, with you know his uh, backpack, if I may <laughs> call it that. And um, Alexander Cunningham, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, who was the founder of the uh, Archaeological Survey of India, uh, published a book on ancient Indian geography in uh, 1871, and he recreated, uh, I don't know if you can see the, all these red lines, all the crisscrossing, crisscrossing travel of Huan Sang uh, uh, in India. He went all the way down to Kanjipuram uh, near Chennai. So, and he left uh, the most extensive uh, uh, memoirs. So these are very precious documents. And um, this is another view of his itinerary where we can also have the Chinese and Central Asian part of it. So something similar so to what Hitzing had traveled. So, you know, this, these were not uh, easy travels to envisage in those days. And there is a Chinese painting showing how Tsuan Sang returns uh, from his uh, uh, travel in the, in the uh, Ganges Plains. Uh, in those days, King Harsha at Kanoj, and uh, not far from here, in fact. So Huan Sang may be crossed uh, Kampu, very likely. And um, he returns with this uh, elephant gifted to him by Harsha, and you can see a huge uh, bundle on the elephant. And well, what the bundle contains is actually manuscripts, because that would be the most precious things, not gold or jewels, uh, which the Chinese had anyway, but manuscripts. And he is said to have brought back 657 Buddhist texts and uh, translated them in uh, uh, with. Uh, and. Um, uh, he writes himself, he says himself, though the Buddha was born in the West, you see this, this is India, right? His dharma has spread to the East, meaning China. In the course of translation, mistakes may have crept into the text and idioms may have been misapplied. When words are wrong, the meaning is lost. And when a phrase is mistaken, the doctrine becomes distorted. This is just to show you how much attention they paid to you know the, the accuracy, the faithfulness of the translation. Um, well, there is plenty of art remaining in China. Uh, I can I cannot show much of it, um, showing the the strong Buddhist presence. Uh, this is from the eighth century A.D. in Maishi Shan uh, caves in northwest China where there are 190 sculptures in something like a thousand caves and recesses and this one measures something like about 15 meters height if I remember correctly. This is another view of this complex uh, where you can see the whole cliff of the whole side of the hill has been carved and uh, these are all uh, cellars which the monks were occupying and uh, <coughs> uh, this is something comparable to the Bamiyan complex and, and immense sculptures all over the face. You can Im imagine the amount of work that, uh, and what you see here, those lines you can see here are huge stairways which have been built for the tourists to, to, to visit the place. Um, among other things, chess is supposed to, according to most scholars, to have traveled to China. There is a kind of Chinese chess uh, which is inspired from uh, Chaturanga. That would be uh, a very ancient contribution, in fact, 3rd century BC. Now, you see, what we have seen so far, the itinerary of these uh, travelers to, China, to India, is actually very largely up to this point, up to up to Central Asia, is actually the Silk Route. You see, one of but the Silk Route was not a single road, um, especially to cross this extremely difficult arid uh, terrain basin or desert. Uh, so they would uh, they would be actually traveling with caravans of traders. We should not imagine them traveling all alone. And uh, this is another view of it showing you, again, the different roads, but also additionally, additionally networks of maritime roads uh, by which the Indo-Chinese trade was taking place. So 
There's a lot of evidence of this trade back home in India. For example, this typical Chinese porcelain, you know, with the white glazing and blue uh, motifs, uh, is found in many parts of India. This one on the left is from Orissa. It's uh, an ancient Manikapatna, ancient pot, very close to Puri. Uh, on the right, you can find uh, more or less same kind of pottery from, uh, of course, uh, from, from Sri Lanka. Of course, archaeologists and uh, pottery experts, uh, porcelain experts, will be giving you all kinds of uh, uh, styles according to the particular Chinese dynasty that produced them. Uh, in uh, many parts also, you find those Chinese coins which typically have a squarish uh, perforation, but you can see the Chinese characters, I mean, if, if you can see closely enough, uh, which are there imprinted on these uh, copper bronze uh, coins. This one is from a place near Kolam when one uh, young archaeologist, Dr. Vinod, who is actually with IIT Ghaninaga now, uh, dredged uh, some, uh, something near a jetty in the sea actually, in the sea and got hundreds, literally hundreds of coins and uh, uh, Chinese uh, porcelain shirts. So this is a potentially very interesting site. Uh, Kerala also more of, of them. So uh, uh, you, can, you can document in many places of the Indian coastline. Now, <clears throat> I have to move on to other regions, uh, quite a few to, to cover. So uh, the, we should not forget uh, that uh, Tibet was a distinct region. It was not part of the Chinese empires in those days at all. In fact, it was never part of, of uh, China in a political sense. And uh, Buddhism entered Tibet, but much later, much later, possibly 6th or 7th century AD. And uh, <clears throat> because, you see, Tibet was a, a, a far more isolated region, geographically speaking, and uh, it had its own uh, you know, local religions, um, and but f finally, one Tibetan king, probably in the seventh century A.D., asked. Uh, there, there was a strong contact between Tibet and Nalanda University in particular. There's a lot of evidence of it, right up to the destruction of Nalanda in the twelfth uh, century, late twelfth century A.D., and even a little beyond. Um, so he asked the chief priest the abbot of Nalanda to come to Tibet and teach Buddhism uh, to and, and create the first monastic orders here. So you have on the left, sorry, you have on the left a painting of this uh, Shantarakshita. And, uh, but then this Shantarakshita found a tremendous opposition and you know Chinese are steeped in occultism. So uh, uh, it was said that uh, uh, the local indigenous faith, which is the bone faith, um, uh, was uh, strongly resisting the, the advent of Buddhism. So they inviting a, a, a Indian tantric expert, Padma Sambhava, he is so native in Tibetan literature, you see, to occultly defeat the forces opposing Buddhism, and he's supposed to have won that battle, and then the and then he he's painted here on another Tibetan painting, and there is this uh, a monastery which he first created, and this pillar, in fact, commemorates. There are inscriptions of it commemorates the. So it, symbolically, you may call it this, the victory of Buddhism over the local faiths. Actually, the local religious traditions, the born religions, were never really stamped out of Tibet. They continued in their own way, but Buddhism did become the dominant religion there. So if you look at the spread of uh, Buddhism uh, uh, altogether, it's a very complex phenomenon. Uh, you have, of course, the, the silk routes leading into China, but there are other routes which were occasionally followed uh, through northeast uh, 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 India, and then you have the maritime routes, which actually should be more numerous than what this map shows, uh, into this region, Southeast Asia, which we are now going to study. But you can see that Korea, for example, <coughs> and Vietnam to some extent, were actually influenced through China. So uh, sometimes the influence was direct from India, sometimes it was indirect through other centers. And this is a phenomenon which has been well studied by generations of 
uh, Indologists. Uh, for in France, in fact, for some reason, quite a few uh, eminent Indologists uh, spoke about it. And this uh, Sylvain Lévy, great Sanskritist, in 1928, in a book called uh, India and the World, um, writes in Indochina in the Malay Archipelago. The study of monuments and inscriptions has revealed Hindu colonies, as he calls it, faithful to India's arts, religions, and literary works. What he is saying is that the, the uh, regional kingdoms were in effect Hindu colonies. Not that people migrated to India, not at all, very few people, but the local people adopted India's arts, religions, and uh, uh, literary works, and in effect, these became a kind of Hindu colonies. Well, the word Hindu has to be understood in those days in a very broad sense. Uh, it included in his mind, it, it, it certainly included Buddhism also. So uh, those scholars called this region, in fact, uh, if you look at the Indological literature, all this region was called Greater India. Uh, today, the terminology has been abandoned because you know we don't want to offend uh, our neighbors and uh, uh, hint to, to Thailand, to Malaysia, to Burma, to Vietnam, to Cambodia, uh, to Laos, uh, to Indonesia, hint to them that uh, they are just colonies from India. That wouldn't do. So the term has been dropped. But it is a fact, it is a fact that this was a very culturally homogeneous um, uh, region. Um, the, the very first evidence, archaeological evidence, goes back to a few centuries BC where glass beads and bangles originating from India uh, were found in the Malay Peninsula as far as Jawa and Borneo. So uh, this is uh, uh, what archaeology confirms. We know that Orissa and Bengal, for obvious geographical reasons, were engaged in, in a lot of trade with all these uh, regions. In fact, Huang Sang himself notes, because he visited Puri, and he notes that there are merchants leaving sailing uh, to distant countries. And of course, those would be the countries. So as I said, 9th century, the Chola kings, uh, ha and they had a very powerful navy, uh, briefly conquered parts of Malaysia and Indonesia. I'll come back to this Sri Vijaya Kingdom. Uh, Indian traders often visited Southeast Asia, as I mentioned. They sold silk, they sold gems, and various luxury items. And they brought back some spices which, did, which were not always available back here in India. Uh, also camphor and fragrant woods. This is what the literature documents. So let us quickly look at this region and, um, uh, you know, this um, Burma, Thailand, Malaysia. Uh, first of all, you can see the names. Just look at the names, first of all. Uh, this, is, this Champa would be Vietnam. Of course, don't imagine that uh, today's countries match exactly, you know, the borders do not match the, the kingdoms of those days. Huh? There have been a lot of fluidity uh, in those regions. But if you look at names, you know, Ayutthaya, uh, uh, for example, it's obviously an alteration of Ayodhya, and we'll we'll come back to this part. Sri Vijaya, uh, Majapahit. So these are Sanskritic Sanskritic names, and um, uh, these were adopted uh, by kings who were not from India. They were the regional kings. So the the model in front, you know, that all this the cultural ideal that, that all those kings those dynasties had in front of them was, was just India. And they, they wanted actually to bring Indian names uh, to, to this region. For example, the Mekong River is a, a distortion alteration of Ma Ganga. So you see you transfer the, the, the names to, uh, from India there to recreate the, the Indian culture. That is one of the mechanisms. So uh, Burma, first century CE, we find establishment of uh, uh, kingdoms such as the Sri Kshetra. So once again, you, you can note the name. Uh, and uh, then we have inscriptions, Buddhist inscriptions, 500 CE. And here it is the uh, Theravada Buddhism, uh, which became the dominant religion. Uh, which, you know, there are two schools broadly of Buddhism. The Theravada Buddhism, which may be 
the Orthodox Buddhism, it is also the Buddhism of Sri Lanka today, and uh, then the Mahayana Buddhism, which uh, uh, the Theravada Buddhists regard as a little corrupt because, uh, you know, uh, original Buddhism was kind of agnostic. There was no notion of God, uh, Buddha in his dialogues always refuses to, to discuss the question of the evidence of God. He doesn't say that there is a God or there is no God. He just says, let's not bother about it, you know. Let's look inside ourselves and uh, 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 try to do what we can to uh, change our, our mind, our, our speech, our uh, behavior, etc. So, but Mahayana Buddhism reintegrated a lot of Hindu gods, basically, in, into its pantheon. So it had Indra, it had Tara, it had uh, Ganapati, I mean all of these uh, became also Buddhist deities. So initially uh, Burma was mostly uh, Theravadin, but later on Mahayana also uh, jumped into the phrase. So lots of uh, hundreds, th actually thousands of pagodas as they are called, uh, pagodas are uh, Buddhist temples and uh, you can kind of already recognize something which is uh, fairly familiar, the canons of architecture uh, where absolutely the Hindu, classical Hindu and Buddhist canons of architecture, but sometimes with some interesting local variations which I will show. And then it's not just Buddhism. Texts like Ramayana, for example, travel widely through this whole region and all of them, as I'll show briefly, have different adaptations. Just as we saw the other day that Ramayana, Mahabharata have thousands of regional adaptations in India, it was exactly the same situation in all these parts. And um, uh, this is a performance of the Burmese uh, Ramayana, which is called the Yama Sattva. Again, pronunciation not guaranteed. Now we move to Thailand, which was actually, one of its names was Siam, but anyway, it, 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 this is a more complex evolution. From the 6th century CE, um, much of the central Thailand was known as Dwaravati, so that is Dwaraka, of course. So you see how uh, proper names are just uh, lifted wholesale and implanted on the landscape to create their own sacred geography, if I may recall the concept we, we saw the other day. So, um, lots of inscriptions have been found. If another Frenchman, Georges Codes, uh, published actually a big book in the 1930s called Hinduized States of, uh, of Southeast Asia. And uh, through that, Buddhism as well as Hinduism spread in the region. I would like to mention briefly that today, you know, we have those labels, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism. In those days, we must understand that the border lines between those faiths were very fluid. And though they were, uh, you know, uh, theoretical disputes on the dogmas, on the philosophies, they differed in some, on some important points. In actual practice, especially for the population, you know, for the large part of the population, there was really no, no essential contradiction. And, and very often you find, uh, uh, in many parts, even in India, you know, you find Hindu, Buddhist, uh, Jain structures next to each other. Uh, there is really no, no war of religion, if I may say so, uh, in the Indian context. So the, the border lines are fluid, which is why we find Hinduism migrating along with Buddhism. And uh, the kingdom of Ayutthaya, as I said, named, uh, uh, it's a distortion of Ayodhya, where kings actually uh, took the, the name Rama, them, the kings themselves named themselves Rama, because this was the ideal. So Rama was the ideal king, so why not adopt the name? And uh, the Ramakian is the Thai version of the uh, Ramayana. In fact, this is a performance. So these performances, always include drama, they include dance, they include music, you know, it's uh, all performing arts together. And much of that, so those performing arts were a mixture, mixture of the great canons of performing arts in India as dictated by the Natya Shastra, you know, but also mixed with uh, regional folk forms. And so they, they, that again is the beauty of freedom given to adapt uh, uh, just as you can adapt the texts, you can also adapt the art forms. 
lots of statues, some of them colossal, like the one on the left. Uh, you have the, the Dharma Chakra, the, the uh, wheel of the, of the Dharma, which is a typical Buddhist symbol. Uh, you have, uh, uh, this is uh, an inroad by the Khmer dynasty, which I will come back to in Cambodia in, in a few minutes, uh, with its typical architecture, which, is, uh, which has a style of its own. And uh, well, as I said, uh, uh, Hinduism also is present, so you have figurines of a lot of uh, Hindu gods, this is Brahma, and if you land at Bangkok, this is the scene that awaits you, you know, the, the Samudra Mantana, the, the churning of the ocean, uh, I think the gods are on the right side and the, the, the demons can be seen far away on the left, and uh, you can see uh, the, that uh, this is a, a piece of Hindu mythology which is proudly displayed even today. So if we go to Malaysia, again the two religions, so more or less there are some minor variations which doesn't, do not really concern us today uh, in the chronology in each region, but it's basically the same phenomenon everywhere. Uh, here there are lots of inscriptions in Brahmi. Uh, uh, which were actually the, the many of these regions had no script initially and they adopted scripts which were either derived from Brahmi from North India as I might uh, recall Brahmi is a script which appears in India probably around 4-500 BC and this is a script of the edicts of Ashoka for example uh, but then some scripts were borrowed from South India also, uh, from the South Indian scripts which they sem they themselves are derivatives of Brahmi. Hmm? So I I'll give you an example uh, in a moment. So um, then the Sri Vijaya Empire was dominated, dominantly uh, Buddhist, uh, but then a Hindu kingdom was carved uh, a little later and corresponds to today the, the state of uh, Perak. And uh, there is a king called Raja Ganga Shah Johan. It's very interesting. Uh, he's the one who was defeated by Rajendra Chola, who is the son of Raja Raja Chola. And uh, well, the Tam Tamil literature actually celebrates this grand victory of uh, the Chola king. So, not only gods, you have also teachers, gurus, uh, rishis, like this one on the left, uh, being portrayed uh, uh, through a lot of art. Um, <coughs> this is Avalokiteshvara. Avalokiteshvara is a bodhisattva. Bodhisattvas, you know, are future Buddhas, right? Uh, they have not yet reached Buddhahood, but they are well on the way to it. So Avalokiteshvara was one of the most popular bodhisattvas for some reason. And uh, this is one uh, uh, statue of him. And just to show that this influence actually has not totally died. Uh, you know, in 19th century, uh, a, a Hindu devotee of Muruga had a dream in which the god, you know, this is a fairly common story, but it is, uh, this is the story we are told here, uh, where the Muruga appeared to him and asked him to create a shrine in the Batu Caves, uh, not far from Kuala Lumpur, which is uh, now uh, very frequently visited, I mean it's on the tourist map of this region uh, and uh, the shrine is very popular. So, so this is just to show you that these mechanisms can take complex forms. Indonesia now, of course, which had several different uh, uh, kingdoms in the course of time, uh, Sri Vijaya, Shailendra, Majapahit, uh, we don't have to see all the details, but uh, this is basically, and here you can see in this uh, map, in fact, you can see all the routes of interaction between all this region. Champa, which broadly, broadly is Vietnam today, Khmer, which broadly is Cambodia, and, and then all, all the islands. So there, there are, Indonesia is very rich in uh, most impressive uh, monuments. Uh, it has the largest stupa uh, in the world. A stupa, if you don't know, is, is a Buddhist funerary monument. It may be a very, very small, you know, mound, uh, 
uh, of Earth. It may be a more elaborate stone structure as you would have heard of these stupas at uh, Sarnat or Sanchi, etc. So it can also be a fairly large construction. But in India, nowhere uh, near this kind of a scale. I don't know if you can make out these little dots here. These are tourists, you see. So you can see the colossal scale of the whole uh, monument. Uh, a stupa is a full monument. You can't enter it. There is, you know, it's not like a temple. You can go inside. There's nothing inside. I mean, it's uh, rather there are things inside which are normally relics, either of the Buddha himself or uh, some very eminent uh, Buddhist uh, saint, scholar, etc. They are funerary monuments basically. And uh, here you you see we will return on actually on a Tuesday to this particular stupa because of its very peculiar geometry. And so we'll uh, discuss that briefly on, on Tuesday. Uh, I think it has some, I forget now, but some 59 uh, statues of the Buddha at the top. Oh, in fact, more than that it looks. So this is an eno enormous construction which shows the kind of influence that Buddhism had. But not only Buddhism, Indonesia has colossal uh, Hindu temples. This is the Prambanam complex. And this is something, again, which uh, uh, you, you, you can understand that the canons of Indian architecture are applied, but they are applied differently. We don't have such tall temples uh, uh, back here in India. Not only that, this is a complex dedicated to the Trimurti, to, to Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva together. And this, again, to my knowledge, there is no such complex available in India, especially Brahma, as you know, is very rarely worshipped. So differences and yet yet uh, 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 massive borrowings from India. Uh, the borrowings take many many uh, aspects. For example here you have the Bhagavad Gita being preached uh, on an, this is an Indonesian painting so the Gita also was there so it's again not just uh, Buddhism. Uh, you can identify Sri Krishna here because of the peacock feather I'm sorry that the projector is uh, removing some colors. Anyway, uh, and he's talking to Arjuna here. And this is, this is actually, so it's a slightly different setting. And of course, they have uh, local features. You see, the, the facial features are very local uh, all the time. Buddha, Buddha looks like a Khmer. He looks like a, a Chinese. He looks like, you know, whatever uh, country he's uh, depicted in. So, so this is an infinite and very interesting variation. And I was telling you about South Indian scripts. Those of you who have seen Pallava Granta script in uh, South India, for example, you know, places like uh, Mahabalipuram and uh, many other parts of uh, where the Pallava, Pallava dynasty uh, uh, ruled in basically uh, eastern coastal Tamil Nadu. Uh, you can recognize the script is almost identical. So this one was borrowed directly fr uh, from South India into Indonesia. And so it didn't come from, from the north. So most of the regional scripts were actually Indian scripts, which is why Indian epigraphists, epigraphists worked a lot in those regions because they were already familiar with the script and the language usually was Sanskrit or Pali. Uh, this inscription is uh, 1600 years old. Uh, again, various depictions, various statues, a lot of art production. Uh, this is Harihara. You know, Shiv, uh, one half is uh, Shiva and the other half is Vishnu. Um, so th this is... Uh, uh, Hindu, of course, deity uh, from very popular in South India in particular. Agastya also is particularly popular and worshipped uh, in South India in many temples. Uh, I am not very sure whether he is so, so worshipped today in the north, though he originates in the north. Bali, of course, is a special case in Indonesia because it is a Hindu enclave. In fact, uh, you know that Indonesia is a predominantly Muslim country. It has the largest Muslim population in the world. Uh, but uh, uh, Bali has a dominant, predominantly Hindu population. And it has preserved, very interestingly, a lot of ancient Hindu rituals, which some, some of which have actually disappeared from 
uh, India. And uh, a lot of in, uh, you know, students of Hinduism, scholars of Hinduism have gone to Bali because they feel that there is a kind of more pristine Hinduism compared to the one in India which has you know, been subject to so many cross influences and uh, changes uh, in the course of time. This is a kind of a, you know, enclave. So uh, that's what makes it very interesting. You can see, of course, the uh, architectural style which is obviously partly Indian but uh, partly uh, the pagoda style uh, of, uh, of the region. Then, of course, uh, in Indonesia, there are relics even today of this heritage. You can recognize the deity, of course, here on the official Indonesian banknotes. I don't think we have Ganesha on, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Indonesian banknotes. I don't think we have Ganesha on our Indian banknotes, no? Right? So, uh, so but, uh, but yet this is a predominantly Muslim nation. So they have no problem, you know, acknowledging this part of the heritage. Um, uh, Indo in Indonesia, and then uh, the official airline is Garuda airline, right? Uh, it is not Indonesian Airlines. So, so it's interesting that uh, this heritage is quite, uh, they are quite at home with it and uh, comfortable with it. And uh, Ramayana, which is also uh, depicted uh, there, I think, yeah, this is a performance of the Ramayana in Indonesia. Uh, in fact, <coughs> many of the artists are usually Muslim. And uh, the, the Indonesia in particular is famous for its puppet, uh, sh puppet shows where Ramayana is one of the main uh, you know, uh, 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 dramas enacted. And the, the, those who make those puppets and who performs are invariably Muslim artists. So you see there is, there is uh, no difficulty in, in uh, uh, maintaining this uh, heritage. Cambodia, com uh, the interaction is, is uh, slightly later, of course it's a little further away, and, uh, but then uh, there are Hindu uh, kingdoms uh, quite stable there for several centuries, and in fact they develop into the Khmer civilization, Khmer empire, of course, uh, the, Khmer, the word Khmer today is uh, mostly known because of the Khmer Rouge, but that was a misappropriation. The Khmer Rouge had absolutely nothing to do historically, no connection whatsoever with this ancient uh, Cambodian empire, uh, which, uh, which had inputs from both Hinduism and Buddhism, 9th to 13th century, about uh, uh, four, five hundred years. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the word Kampuchea derives from, from Khmer. So there, of course, there are colossal temples, some of which are still being discovered today in remote forests. Uh, sometimes, you know, even an entire city, I think, a couple of years ago was traced and uh, is being explored. This is, these are the uh, Angkor Thom temples, and uh, this is uh, a, a Buddhist uh, uh, temple. The, uh, again, Avalokiteshvara is portrayed. Now, this is a departure from classical Indian architecture because you don't, in India we don't represent faces on the sides of the, you know, shikhar or vimana, uh, but this is done in this region. So these adaptations always occur and, and you know, make it very uh, diverse. And this is, of course, the famous Angkor Wat temple, absolutely colossal. Uh, if you take the entire enclosure, entire, it, it exceeds, I think, 1.8 kilometer is the largest uh, dimension. And uh, I, I, I forget this, but this is, uh, this is uh, not far from one kilometer. So enormous on a scale totally uh, unknown. In India, you may have heard that uh, previous Bihar chief minister, I think, said that he wanted to uh, build uh, uh, a temple as large as Angkor Wat in Bihar and uh, well the Cambodian government was a little upset uh, with this but um, I don't think it's, going, it's likely to happen. Uh, in any case, the, the, here the, you see this concept uh, which we will come back to on Tuesday of multiple enclosures. This is typically, typically the Indian concept, multiple enclosures and then these towers, these shikhas, and the central one, and this is absolutely the Hindu canon uh, of architecture, symbolizes Mount Meru. 
Mount Meru is this mythical mountain which is the axis of the universe. The whole universe is set to, uh, you know, uh, rotate uh, uh, around this uh, mountain. Well, there are many concepts of Meru, but this is this is Meru. This is the cosmic, uh, the axis of the universe. In fact, the whole temple, I'll return to that, is nothing but an image of the of the universe. So absolutely colossal, enormous, and there are many many statues, frescoes, panels. Some of these panels are 50 meters long and they narrate stories either from Hindu mythology. Here you have the, again the uh, churning of the ocean. You can remember here the, this is I think Kurma Avatar, uh, the, the Vishnu taking the uh, appearance of the tortoise to uphold uh, the, the uh, mountain which is used to churn the ocean. And you have the, the devas and the asuras on, on either side. So, but, but also plenty of panels, plenty narrating stories from Mahabharata and Ramayana, both of them. So uh, it's, it's a very, I mean, it's an extremely rich uh, uh, structure and uh, it takes days to visit properly if you wish to. Um, even before the Khmer came, uh, you know, there is evidence of uh, uh, already uh, quite substantial Indian presence. This is a Ganesha. Uh, it could be Hindu Ganesha or Buddhist Ganesha. This is hard to say. Then in Vietnam, uh, similar story. So, except as I mentioned, I'm sorry. Except as I mentioned uh, that um, for the fact that uh, the influence here came more from China than directly, but. But the capital of the ancient kingdom there, seventh century, was called Indrapura, quite simply. Mm -hmm. So you can see that uh, the, the Sanskritic names were all over the geography. It had temples to Shiva, Buddha. Uh, Buddhism was equally uh, present there. Uh, and uh, you s these pictures are showing you some of the structures uh, there. Uh, so as I said, <coughs> it's not just the religions sometimes uh, uh, architecture, of course, plenty, the arts, sometimes a little bit of science, the literature, the, the, the epics uh, in particular, the mythology, but also the scripts. And here you see uh, a, a map drawn by a French scholar showing you the diffusion of uh, Indian, so the North Indian scripts, uh, especially the various uh, uh, Brahmi and post-Brahmi uh, you know, like Nagari, Gupta, Brahmi, and so on, scripts are migrating through China all the way to Japan, where some inscriptions have been found. But also, but then the South Indian scripts uh, migrate into Southeast Asia. So this is also a, a major contribution from India. Um, we have uh, some presence, of course, in Japan. Well, Buddhism, I don't have to uh, even uh, spend time because uh, Japan is officially a Buddhist country and it's interesting that several of these countries adopted Buddhism as a kind of state religion which actually India never did. Even when Ashoka was uh, promoting Buddhism uh, through his edicts it's very clear he nevertheless never imposed it. He never declared that Buddhism was a state religion you know that it was the religion of Bharat. He never said that. So he, he wanted the, you know f uh, uh, freedom uh, f for everyone to choose uh, his own path and that he states quite explicitly in one of his edicts. So, so uh, but perhaps because these countries were smaller countries and a single kingdom you know could rule over the entire country it was easier to have the concept of a state religion. But nevertheless, nevertheless uh, Japan has uh, some uh, presence of uh, not only Hinduism but here Hinduism in its Vedic form. This is actually a Vedic uh, homakunda where you can discern uh, the fire sacrifice and this object here is actually the Vajra of Indra. You know this is the thunderbolt of Indra. So this is how um, you know Indian uh, thought uh, rituals, concepts migrated, other things migrated like uh, medicine in particular. I've not had time to deal with the spread. Actually, the spread of Ayurveda through this region uh, would be in itself quite a fascinating topic. But I will close this with a 
a fairly longish quote, but it summarizes very well the whole spirit in which this culture, this civilization spread. That is to say, the modality of the interface. You know, how did it really take place? And this is from Sri Aurobindo, who writes about 1914-1915. He writes, at no time does India seem to have been moved towards an aggressive military and political expansion beyond her own borders, well, with the exception of the Chola campaign. No epic of world dominion, no great tale of far-born invasion or expanding colonial empire has ever been written in the tale of Indian achievement. The sole great endeavor of expansion, of conquest, of invasion she attempted was the expansion of her culture, the invasion and conquest of the Eastern world by the Buddhistic idea, and the penetration of her spirituality, art, and thought forces. And this was an invasion of peace and not of war, for to spread a spiritual civilization by force and physical conquest, the vaunt or the excuse of modern imperialism, you see he's writing at a time when, in 1914-15, where India is still under British domination, I mean it is part of the, and imperialism is still not defeated in the world, would have been uncongenial to the ancient caste of her mind and temperament and the idea underlying her dharma. So, so this is, uh, this is uh, the story in brief of uh, India's expansion uh, uh, eastward and you know it gave a kind of identity of its own to the whole of Asia. There were very few, I, I could have included other regions, for example Mon Mongolia was uh, uh, deeply influ influenced by uh, Buddhism uh, today it has been quite eradicated by communism, a little bit remains. Tibet, of course, we know that uh, this is also the case. Uh, so if you look at the entire map of Asia, basically it was uh, 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 the India's sphere of influence, if I may use the current geopolitical language. And, uh, but then this was something that, uh, this is the, my main point in conclusion, which was not something deliberately planned from India. Nobody in India you know, decided that uh, let us turn Mongolia or, or Japan into a, into a Buddhist uh, country. It just happened. It was an organic phenomenon in which those countries willingly, happily, not only welcome, but sometimes called for the influence from India. And therefore it shows that there was something in this Indian culture, uh, literature, mythology, art forms, etc., that, that they wanted, that they felt deeply attracted to. So, so this is why, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, uh, many uh, Western scholars speak, for example, of uh, Asiatic wisdom, you know, Asian wisdom. Well, they mean basically uh, this totality of uh, Indian influence. So this was a brief um, overview of, of uh, the Eastern world. And um, we'll come back to it in a few uh, points like architecture and a few more things which we'll see in future lectures. Thank you.